This is a 1960 Plymouth Fury pillarless coupe. Very, very typical of the late 50s, rock and roll, fins and chrome, body styling, typical features, twin headlamps, overhanging eyebrows, beautiful wrap round glass, stunning windshield, a low cut roof line, and of course, no post in the center. A very, very sleek looking, stylish, some may say ostentatious looking car. This is a top of the range Fury model and it has an awful lot of stainless steel and glitzy trimmings. Look at all these stainless steel finishes around here. Inserts on the wheel arches, huge pieces of polished stainless right down the side here, Kelsey Hayes, chrome wire wheels, full sided white wall tyres to the original cross ply profile so the car sits at the correct height. Really incredible looking motor car. Huge badges on the tail fin with a trickle or flag. Tells you that's a fury. That's a top of the range. Plymouth did a range of cars in 1960 with the same kind of tail fins, but there were very, very low specification models. A Plaza, a Savoy, mid-range car was the Belvedere. This is the top of the range fury. Only the fury gets the pillarless low cut roof line. This is the original colour scheme for this car, which is a metallic bronze. A very, very bright, attractive looking car. Yet again, that post-war optimism, the rock and roll period, fins and chrome, luxury and power era. This is a very, very flash looking motor car. This was a bit of a new direction for Plymouth in 1960. Although they retained the look of the late 50s with the big fins, this, this of course is a Virgil Exner design, the guy who basically came out with this finned, tail fin design in 1956 with, uh, with Chrysler Corporation or Mopar as it's affectionately known. But this year is actually the first year for a unibody or a monocoque construction design. Previous designs of Plymouth and uh, Mopar products were on a separate frame, a full chassis with the body bolted onto the frame. This is a unibody construction with a subframe at the front which runs into the bulkhead and into the front floor areas. It's a very, very rigid design of car and it completely transformed the way these cars handled. Prior to this, American cars from this period were notorious for a very soft, spongy ride where the car would wallow from side to side. A very, very comfortable ride for the passengers, but not a very stable car on the road. This design of car changed everything. This, is, this car also benefits from torsion bar suspension, which yet again was a Chrysler feature. These cars drive fantastic, they really do. Take a quick look inside the car. So we've got a very, very original interior here, original door cards. Very, very tidy seating, original headliner, good car. It's beautiful dashboard in this car. Just look at the dash cluster. Look at the instrument panel. It's like something from a, from a spaceship. Of course, this car was manufactured long before man ever landed on the moon in 1969. This was 10 years prior to this, almost. We've got a push button automatic transmission. This is a, a, this is a Chrysler Corporation Torque Flight 8 transmission. We've got the original factory radio in there and we've also got air conditioning from the factory. This is a true California spec car. It's got a very, very heavily tinted green glass in it. The glass is immaculate in this car. There's no scratches from wiper blades. There's no big rock chips. And we've also got, which is pretty unusual for a, for a Plymouth, in terms of specification options, we've got four power windows on this car and we've got a power front bench seat. Yet again, this car is pillarless, there's no centre post, so on all the windows are down in this car, the full sides open, it's fabulous, almost feels like a convertible on the road. We just talked a little bit about the running gear, we'll just lift the hood and take a look on the underside of the hood here. This car's been equipped with a 318 cubic inch poly-headed V8 from the factory. 
It's not the highest specification engine they did in 1960, but it's kind of like mid to three quarters of the way up the range. Original air cleaner on this car, original two barrel carburetor on this car. These engines are nine to one compression ratio, which anybody who knows about American engineering know for the period, it's pretty high compression. Most American cars are around about six and a half, seven and a half to one ratio. This is nine to one. Hence, what we ended up with was a pretty powerful and fast car for its day. These cars were actually raced at the Indianapolis circuit and at Daytona, and the performance was pretty spectacular. The police also liked to use Plymouth with 318 in the day as well. These were hot pursuit cars for the police. Not only did you have the power, but you had the handling with the torsion bar suspension and the rigidity, which we spoke about earlier. Another thing I really like about these cars and I think is outstanding for the period is the transmission that they used. The, the Chrysler Corporation torque flight automatic transmission, it's a three speed automatic transmission, but the traction on these is very, very positive. It's very, very direct. And the change from first, second, second to third is so incredibly smooth on these cars. Compared with other products of the time, if we take, for example, General Motors Cadillac, top of the range, very, very popular cars, 59, 60 Cadillac, big fin cars, yet again, similar styling to this. They were equipped with a four-speed cast iron hydromatic transmission. Compared to this, Cadillac had an antiquated gearbox in, it, in, in its cars at that particular time. This car, mechanically, is far superior from the equivalent year of Cadillac. The drive's so much better, it's so much more positive. This car handles great. This car, from a stand and start, you can rip the tyres off it. The power is so direct and it's instant. This is a fantastic driving automobile. Fantastic driver, fantastic style. If you look up, back at the engine again under the bonnet of the car, you can see that the engine's nicely detailed. The previous owner of the car spent over 30 30 grand on this car preparing it for pretty much a daily use in Los Angeles where, where we bought the car. Engines being out, removed, completely rebuilt as is the transmission. We've got some nice mechanical upgrades and, and modifications on this car as well. The original drum brakes on the front have been replaced with vented discs. Of course that's power assisted, that's the vacuum servo we've got over there. So this car stops as good as it looks. We've also had a modification on the rear end of the brakes, we're still on drums but it's running slightly later, 63 rear axle uh, with non-tapered half shafts. Anybody who knows anything about Chrysler engineering from the period will know non-tapered shafts are a huge upgrade. So this car is off the button, runs and drives fantastic, looks to die for. That is a stunning looking motor car. You just drop down the hood and get the full profile. Chrome's nice and bright on this car. We've got the painted cove in the front, which is very reminiscent of the 58 to 60 Corvette. It's a really gorgeous look. We've got the same color on the roof as well. That is how the car left the factory in, in that metallic bronze color scheme. The Kelsey Hayes wire wheels have been added at a later date. Features like this, this is an optional extra for 1960, the stainless steel wheel arch insert. It gives the, it gives the whole wheel arch a beautiful depth. You could, typical of American car production uh, at the time, there was a huge option list for these cars. I've owned Furies over the years from 1960 that have been much lesser specification than this. To get green tinted glass, air condition, and these extra trimmings on the car, power seats, power windows, it's a really high spec Fury. If you could afford this much money for a Plymouth Fury in 1960, you could have upgraded to a higher range Mopar product car, maybe a Chrysler or an Imperial. So high spec Furies are pretty rare. This car has been in Southern California all its life, in the Los Angeles. Look worldwide and see if you can find another 1960 Plymouth Fury filled this coupe. Don't forget, this car is a California black plate original. It was supplied to Southern California. It's been in the Los Angeles area all its life. Hence, it's been in a low humidity climate. It's rust free. It hasn't suffered from corrosion. Now these 60 Plymouths, 
Whether it be in the first year of human body, they were much lighter, they were rigid, so they cut down on the gauge of the steel. Subsequently, decades and decades later, these cars suffered quite badly from corrosion. I've owned a lot of 1960 Plymouth Furies over the years, predominantly four doors. Every single one has suffered from corrosion. The worst areas tend to be on the inner sills or rockers to our American friends or in the trunk floor. The trunk floor on this is perfect. It's rock solid, never had any repairs. There is no corrosion there. This is a fantastic dry desert find 60 Plymouth Fury Coupe. Another thing to bear in mind with this car as well as this car, if you're into this, that kind of thing, has had a celebrity owner for the last 20 years. This car belonged to the bass player of the, uh, of the rock band System of a Down. Uh, the gentleman's name is Shab, I do believe, and he had this car mechanically rebuilt for his own personal use around Los Angeles. It's all fully documented. We've got some interesting artifacts, which were Shab's personal possessions, which were left in the car. Small things, some interesting documentation, but this is a Los Angeles celebrity, celebrity owned 1960 Plymouth View. It's the very last year for tail fins from Plymouth. It was the end of an era. Probably one of the most stunning eras of motor car production that we've ever known.